A reading from the Gospel of Luke, the 14th chapter. Now large crowds were traveling with Jesus, and he turned and said to them, Whoever comes to me and does not hate father and mother, wife and children, brothers and sisters, yes, and even life itself, cannot be my disciple. Whoever does not carry the cross and follow me cannot be my disciple. For which of you, intending to build a tower, does not first sit down and estimate the cost to see whether he has enough to complete it? Otherwise, when he has laid a foundation and is not able to finish, all who see it will begin to ridicule him, saying, This fellow began to build and was not able to finish. Or what king, going out to wage war against another king, will not sit down first and consider whether he is able with 10,000 to oppose the one who comes against him with 20,000. If he cannot, then while the other is still far away, he sends a delegation and asks for the terms of peace. So therefore, none of you can become my disciple if you do not give up all your possessions. Hear what the Spirit is saying to the church. Thanks be to God. Jesus is not offering a bait and switch. 
Come on, it'll be fun. Where we're going, there's nothing but penthouse apartments and apple martinis. But rather, a clear-eyed depiction of what likely awaits those who join him on his road. A painful and humiliating death, rather than a cushy life, is what lies ahead. At the end of the road is not a throne, but a cross. He tells, us them, tells them this explicitly in verse 27. Whoever does not carry the cross and follow me cannot be my disciple. If he were the pastor of a church in the 21st century, his colleagues would probably consider him a failure. You can hardly expect to pack the pews with a message like that. What you really need to do, Jesus, is to deliver affirming messages that provide practical tips for parents and show people how to live prosperous, healthy, victorious lives as members of God's royal family and put on a professional sound and light show to help you get your message across. Maybe put a Starbucks in the vestibule. Give the people what they want. Meet their felt needs. That's how you grow a congregation. That's how you keep the offering plates full and the budget funded. It's a pity, but Jesus doesn't take their advice. In fact, he ups the ante. Besides the familiar call to take up the cross, he throws in two more provocative requirements that are sure to thin the ranks even further. He says, whoever comes to me and does not hate father and mother, wife and children, brothers and sisters, yes, and even life itself, cannot be my disciple. And he says, none of you can become my disciple if you do not give up all your possessions. These two sayings are tough, albeit for different reasons. The first one presents a challenge because it sets up an opposition between two values that we usually consider compatible. Uh, compatible our commitments to family, and to our religious practice. The second one is tough because, well, because we don't want to do it. Let's look at the one about hating family. The first thing that preachers and commentators always point out is that Jesus is employing a rhetorical device common at that time, known as hyperbole. It's an exaggeration for effect. Like when he talks about camels passing through the eyes of needles, or cutting off your hand when it causes you to sin. He does not mean for his followers literally to hate their families. He is simply setting up a stark contrast between their family loyalty and their loyalty to him. If the former outweighs the latter, you might as well stay home. You cannot be the wholehearted disciple Jesus is looking for. Well, that's true at all about hyperbole, I mean, but it may serve to obscure the radical nature of this pronouncement. Even if he doesn't mean that we have to hate our parents or even unfriend them on social media, he does mean that he and his mission must take precedence over all family obligations. In that culture, it's hard to imagine a more shocking suggestion to make. One's individual honor is inseparable from the honor of one's family. And one is bound by thick cords of custom and social expectation that to make it the highest priority to care for one's parents, siblings, spouse, and children. It could be that one reason Jesus got such a negative reception when he preached in the village synagogue at Nazareth, his hometown, is because in the townspeople's view, he had flouted all these conventions and brought shame on himself and his family when he embarked on his preaching career. As the first, firstborn son with at least one parent still living, to have left his home and his trade as a carpenter was about the worst thing he could have done. He was a bad son. And now he is encouraging others to be bad sons and daughters too. Who does he think he is, anyway? He didn't say you have to hate your family to serve God. He said you have to hate your family if you want to follow him. Isn't it the same sort of thing that cult leaders like Jim Jones and David Koresh are notorious for saying? Where does he get off? The answer, at least my answer, is that Jesus identifies his mission so closely with God's vision for the world that following him and being part of the reign of God are in his mind one and the same thing. That's why he's able to make demands that would be the height of arrogance blasphemy even, coming from the mouth of any other person. His opinion of himself 
is borne out by the lengths he goes in obedience to God and by God's vindication of him in the resurrection. So much so that before too many years pass, his followers have begun hailing him as the Son of God, even God incarnate. And we're still doing it today. So apparently Jesus feels justified in demanding a greater allegiance than one owes one's own family. But it's not hard to imagine a lot of potential followers balking at this difficult and countercultural pronouncement. It's even easier to imagine him bolting for the exits when he drops his second bombshell. None of you can be my disciple if you do not give up all your possessions. Wow. Even for his audience, which comprised the poorest of the poor in first century Galilee, this is a hard saying. For us, even more so. I can see Jesus' ministry colleagues off in the distance, sadly shaking their heads and clucking their tongues. We tried to tell them, they seem to be saying with genuine, genuine pity, now look what he's gone and done. Of course, those guys would never have even told the two parables that Jesus tells. Consider carefully before you begin a project. Calculate the likely cost of the venture before jumping in. Why on earth would you tell anyone to do that? The trick is to make the venture as comfortable and risk-free as possible, then there's no reason to hesitate. And they must be right. After all, the reclining theater-style seats with the cup holders in their 4,000-seat auditoriums are full at all three services every Sunday morning. And over here is poor Jesus left with his scraggly band of disciples as the crowds that had been hanging on his every word just days before head back home in a steady stream. Probably to their churches. But Jesus knows something those preachers do not. Or rather, he is looking for something they are not. He is looking for unshakable, bone-deep commitment to the reign of God. He's looking for people who will not fall away when the chips are down, or if they do, who have the grit to pick themselves up and get back in the ring. He wants people who know the cost of discipleship, that it costs everything, but who also know its value, that it is worth far more than anything they could ever give up. He's looking for people who are ready to remove every obstacle to their participation in his mission who are able to declare their primary allegiance to God and God's reign and not go back on their word, who have the courage and trust to give up everything for God, maybe even their own lives. He is a potter looking for the right piece of clay. Six hundred some years before Jesus, the prophet Jeremiah has an epiphany while watching a potter ply her trade. He watches her throw her clay on the wheel, work with foot pedal to set the wheel spinning, and begin using her hands to shape the clay, making it climb up as if by magic into the form she has in mind. At one point, however, something goes wrong and the bowl becomes misshapen, and she has to start over. Not with a new batch of clay, though. She simply kneads the aborted bowl back into a lump, throws it on the wheel, and goes to work again. The feeling comes over Jeremiah so strongly in that moment that he is sure God is speaking to him, saying, Can I not do with you, O house of Israel, just as this potter has done? Just like the clay in the potter's hand, so are you in my hand, O house of Israel. Jeremiah understands God to mean that God has the freedom to change the divine mind about the fate of God's people. If God has a plan for the people's prosperity, but they act wickedly, God is free to toss the lump of clay back on the wheel and go in a different direction. Likewise, if God has willed punishment for the people, but they repent and begin doing right, God can and will call off the punishment and form a new object from that piece of clay. Jeremiah concludes by having God say, Look, I am a potter shaping evil against you and devising a plan against you. Turn now, all of you, from your evil way and amend your ways and your doings. There is still time. The potter can still make something new from that lump of clay. Now this metaphor of God as the potter and us as the clay is a powerful one, 
But as with all metaphors, it eventually breaks down. The difference between a lump of clay and a person or a group of people, at least in most cases, is that the clay has no independent will. It is entirely at the command of the potter. And the only way it can mess up the potter's work is by being of low quality in the first place. It cannot choose to act contrary to the potter's will. We, on the other hand, are notoriously ornery. We have free will, and we exercise it freely and willfully. We can choose to rebel against God's plans for us, and we can choose to cooperate with them. The divine potter can only mold and persuade. God cannot, or at least will not, coerce us into any shape without our consent. That's why Jesus is so careful in choosing his disciples. He knows we need to be all in from the beginning, because half-hearted followers are almost certain to fall away when the going gets tough. In his letter to the Romans, Paul urges the church there to be living sacrifices. As someone once observed, however, the trouble with living sacrifices is that they keep crawling off the altar. Frankly, no. In the song that Alex and Jacob sang earlier, the narrator says, Lord, if I'm the clay, then lay me down on your spinning wheel. Shape me into something you can fill, something real. It's the cry of one who, like the prodigal son, has tried to call his own shots in life and failed utterly, and now realizes that cooperation with God's will is a far superior long-term strategy than resistance. This is human clay that is ready to be formed and shaped by the sure and loving hand of one whose wisdom and vision far exceeds his own. This is clay that wants to be made into something the potter will find useful. In common Christian parlance, this is usually called surrender. But I suppose it is. But I don't think we need to bring in all the negative baggage that comes with that word. God is not looking for hollow people who are too weak to resist any longer. God wants whole persons, whole persons who are willing to cooperate with God's purposes. God wants co-workers, not slaves. Jesus will not abduct us from our families or confiscate our possessions. He simply asks us to make our allegiance to him and his vision of the reign of God our highest allegiance. He wants us to lay aside voluntarily the clutter and trappings of the world that threaten to keep us from throwing ourselves on the spinning wheel and asking the potter to shape us into something real. Jesus is ready to go to extreme lengths to give up everything for God's will, and he is asking us to be prepared to do the same. He wants our full commitment, and when you think about it, he's done enough to deserve it. So the next time the potter goes looking for a suitable piece of clay, will we be ready to volunteer? The next time Jesus calls, which, if you listen closely, could be right now. How will we respond? Amen. Our hymn of response.